I'm Florina. I'm Josh. Hello. And we're going to go through data interpretation today. Not the most exciting topic, but we've tried to make it as simple and easy to understand as possible. So what we'll be covering today, we'll try and go through ABGs, anemias, liver function tests, and user needs. Right, so I'm going to start with ABGs. If at any point you have a question, or if I'm really like putting it across in a stupid way, just tell me. I'm very, very happy to be stopped or asked, as anyone that's met me on the ward will know. So, ABGs. Uh, this is how you take one. I'm going to cover it very, very quickly. Basically, you can take it from the radial, the brachial, the femoral artery. I'm sure you've all taken it. There's actually two types of techniques. Some people go 90 degrees, some people go 45. As long as you get it, I don't think it matters. Important points to note are squirt out the heparin. There's actually a dilutant effect. It's quite fascinating if you like basic science, is that the hemoglobin, uh, readings uh, are really off and they, they rely on the hemoglobin readings for the PO2 and PCO2, so there we go. And air bubbles lead to false readings, as I'm sure you already know. But more interestingly and more what you want to know. So, the acid-base system in the body, buffer system, if you remember from chemistry, it's very, very simple and very straightforward. I'm not going to go through it very much because we'll go through it as we go along and you'll understand it a bit more then. So, the buffer system in the body focuses on two main organs, the lungs, which control the CO2, goes out, and the kidneys, which control the bicarb. And if you don't remember from your physiology, which you may not, the kidneys control bicarb by excreting H+. So every time it excretes an H+, it also creates a bicarb molecule through uh, basically that reaction. And so uh, if your kidneys are buggered, you're a bit buggered sometimes. So. What can go wrong with the system and what can go wrong with it? Questions about that very quickly, metabolic acidosis? No? Moving on. Respiratory acidosis. So respiratory acidosis is uh, a bit interesting as well. My arrows are all over on this one. I apologize for that. So basically, in respiratory acidosis, your CO2 is raised. And your raised CO2 pushes the whole equilibrium, Le Chatelier's principle, if you remember that from A-levels, uh, all the way across. And you get uh, raised hydrogen ions and raised bicarb, but your raised bicarbs at a lower level than the raised hydrogen ions, so you become acidotic. So it's all raised CO2 leading to raised hydrogen ions. That's respiratory acidosis. And compensation is metabolic by the kidneys. Remember I told you this process? The kidneys get rid of the hydrogen ions and you get raised bicarb. Does that make sense, roughly? I'm going very fast, I apologize. Lorena's got a whip on her time. Right, so causes. So causes of acidosis are basically acute or chronic. Acute tend to be uncompensated, chronic tend to be compensated. And the way I like to think of respiratory acidosis is it's essentially failure of ventilation. Even the sort of chronic causes, they're both failures of ventilation, just acute failures of ventilation and chronic failures of ventilation. For all ABG patterns, this is probably the one you will see the most. Uh, which is respiratory acidosis. And anyone that's spent any time in a respiratory ward will know that all the CAPD patients have this. Uh, so the pattern, it's again decreased uh, pH because you're acidotic. It's now respiratory, so the left hand or the right hand side for you of the equation is now affected as opposed to the left hand side. So you're getting a raised CO2. Your bicarb will be normal if it's uncompensated. If it's compensated, you get the same pattern, your pH might be normal, and that's a really important thing with any compensated acidosis or alkalosis, is that the pH may be normal, and you need to remember that a normal pH doesn't necessarily mean anything. But I will go through a very nice way of figuring that out in a bit. So, that's respiratory acidosis. Metabolic acidosis. So, this is very straightforward. Again, it's an alkal alkalosis, so you have decreased hydrogen ions or increased bicarb. So it's very, very simple. Again, I'm going very fast. There's lots of up and down arrows. I apologize. It's one of those things. But I'm happy to slow down if you want me to, or speed up even more if you want me to. And then compensation is, again, the opposite way. I think once you've explained one of them, it's really fairly straightforward. I think people get lost in the sort of ups and downs of the arrows, and it sort of confuses you a lot. But if you... I honestly think, not everyone learns the same way, but that if you remember this sort of formula, you can figure it out quite easily. If you want a really easy way, I will show you at the end a very, very quick and easy and dirty way of figuring it out. So, 
metabolic alkalosis, common causes, you guys have all done your specialities last year, you may or may not remember pyloric stenosis is one of the biggest causes of metabolic alkalosis. The other interesting cause is hypokalemia, uh, and I think that we should, we've got a little bit of time to say, does anyone know how hypokalemia causes an alkalosis? Any thoughts? Blank faces. Exactly, so that's, if anyone followed what he was saying, basically, so the, the cells in the body have to maintain an electrochemical gradient, yes? And the ions that match are potassium and hydrogen, if you think of it like that. So if you're low in potassium outside the cells, hypokalemia, your body wants to move all your potassium from your cells into the body, which means that all your hydrogen ions have to go inside the cells because you have to have a balance or you're going to be positively charged outside and negatively charged inside, if that makes sense. Anyway, if you don't want to remember how to figure it out, you can just remember that hypokalemia causes it. I know people like to learn different levels of information. Anyway, so there's the pattern. It's a raised pH uh, and a raised bicarb, and I think you're starting to understand the pattern. You probably already knew the pattern very well. I will show you the quick and dirty way to figure it out which will make all of this redundant. So respiratory alkalosis is decreased CO2. It is as it is. CO2 pushes the whole thing, the Chatelier's principle, means you have less of that. And if you have less of that, it's very simple. You, uh, you have less hydrogen ions, so you have an alkalosis, and it's respiratory because you have less CO2. And it's all about the pattern. So you know that if you have lots of CO2, you have acidosis. So if you have an alkalosis and a little bit of CO2, it must be respiratory. If you have an alkalosis and you have a lot of CO2, well, that doesn't match up, so it's probably a metabolic alkalosis with compensation, if that makes sense. And I always remember it off the carbon dioxide, because you know lots of carbon dioxide makes an acidosis. So, interesting causes, psychiatric, artificial ventilation, that's us. So patients on ITU often present with a respiratory alkalosis because we overventilate them. And there's the pattern which I won't go through because I think by now you have the idea. So, very briefly, one of the things that I found that when you learn about ABGs is you're learning all about the alkalosis, acidosis, respiratory, metabolic. You forget about the fact that we want to know how well oxygenated they are. And so type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure, very easy. Type 1 is low oxygen. So the way I like to remember it is type 1 is one thing's wrong. You've only got a low oxygen. Your CO2 is normal or a bit low. Um, and it's usually caused by problems with os oxygenation. The characteristic condition is this condition here. Yeah, any ideas? If I tell you there's someone's have a suggestion. This is an ITU patient. You can see the ventilation tube. You can see all the tubes. There are bilateral pulmonary infiltrates. Not pneumonia. Good guess. It's not quite consolidated enough. ARDS. ARDS. There we go. So if you see the word bilateral pulmonary infiltrates, ARDS. It's almost always the answer, especially if they're ITU and they're ventilated. Type 2 respiratory failure. Two things wrong. You have a low oxygen and a high CO2. This is your COPD patient. It's treated using this. What's this? So it's a BiPAP mask, exactly. And if you don't understand the difference between CPAP and BiPAP, ask me at the end and I will go through it with you. Base excess. Oh, base excess is really boring. You don't really need to know about it. Some medical schools really harp on it. Does yours? No, good. Base excess is basically equal to serum bicarb. Uh, if you don't need to know about it, I will skip over it and you can come back to it. Or does some, do you guys want me to go through it? No? Very good. <laughs> Compensation. Forget about this equation. I put it up there because you should know that there are some cases when that are compensated and you're not sure if it's an acidosis or an alkalosis because the pH is normal and the pattern could be either 
a respiratory acidosis or a metabolic alkalosis. And the way you then figure it out is using this complex equation by expecting finals that would be a bit harsh. Fine, so a pattern. So what I'll do is I'll very quickly go through this with you and then I'll show you the really quick and easy way to do it. So on our left is my way, which is, is that you look at the pattern, you say, is it acidotic or alkalotic? Really easy, because you'll have your normal ranges. If you don't have your normal ranges, you have to learn them, I'm afraid. 7.35 to 7.45 is normal. If it's too low, it's acidotic. If it's too high, it's alkalotic. You then look, is it respiratory or metabolic? And that's about matching the pattern. So if your CO2 is high and it's an acidosis, it's respiratory. If your CO2 is high and it's an alkalosis, it's metabolic. And that's the easy way to remember. Whereas I use the other way, which is like the five-step way. So I initially assess the patient while well, I was taught, first of all. Then you look at the oxygen status. Are they hypoxic or not? Uh, then you look at the pH, and that tells you whether, and again, are they acidotic or alkalotic. And then to find out if it's either respiratory or metabolic, you look at the CO2, and then I look at the metabolic component and the base excess. So that's kind of the step I, the way approach I use. Them. So they both work. They mm -hmm. both work. Uh, and another easy way is the different or same rule. So if you have a low pH and a low CO2, so they're the same, it's not likely to be that as the problem. If you have a difference, so if you have a raised CO2 and a low pH, it's different and therefore it's a respiratory problem. Whereas, so yeah, it works, trust me. We can go through it more later if you like. Otherwise, this, the, the, this way here is actually the official uh, ALS guidelines. But there we go. So, this is my really quick and easy way to do it. If you can draw this on a piece of paper, it looks ridiculously complicated, but it's actually not. It's a really good way to visualize. So, you've, j you've got, uh, so forget about all of that for a minute. You've got pH on this side. The lower it goes, the more alkalotic it is. If it's on this side, it's a respiratory. If it's on that side, it's an alkalosis, and that's just PCO2. So, you can see you can actually figure it all out just from the pH and the PCO2. So if you try and remember that sort of way of thinking about it, so it's, it's, it's a lot more complicated than, it looks compli more complicated than it is. It's four, it's two axes and four quadrants, essentially. And you just figure out which quadrant it lies in and that tells you the answer. Do you see that? It's actually a really simple and straightforward way of doing it. If you, if you just remember which, how to draw the axes, i.e. one's going the wrong way, the quadrants work, trust me. I think you'll have these slides, so what I suggest you do is when you get the slides and go home or access them however you access them, you draw this out, but draw it just as quadrants, and you'll see it's a really good and logical and quick and easy way of thinking about it, and you don't have to remember anything else. There we go. We've got some practice ones, if you like. So first of all, we've got a 17-year-old patient who comes in presently acutely unwell, We've got these AVG results, so if you just have a quick look at them, and if you want to talk me through what you think is happening. I know some of your names, by the way, so I will pick on you. <laughs> you know who you are. So if someone wants to have a go at this. Uh, volunteers. Anyone, do you want to go? Have a go? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So yeah, severely partially compensated metabolic acidosis. Uh, the next one is something that you might commonly see in MAU or in respiratory ward. So it's a 67-year-old man, he's a heavy smoker, 20 cigarettes a day, he's been admitted with worsening <coughs> shortness of breath. So these are the AVG results. Again, take a second to go through them, and again, one of you want to go through with it? Any volunteers? Yeah, I think man is looking very intently in the red, yeah, you just looked at me. Right, how do you know? How do you know? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what 
could that mean? Yes and no. So actually, if you look, so the pH is normal, so you don't know if it's an acidosis or an alkalosis. The fact that the PCO2 is high makes you automatically think this goes to acidosis. But if you then forget the history and look at the bicarb, the bicarb's high too. So it could be that you have a metabolic alkalosis, which is co being compensated for. So your body's trying to make you more acidic by acidotic by raising your PCO2. Do you see that? Or it could be that you've got a res respiratory acidosis, which your body's compensating for by raising your bicarb. And this is the type of situation where, one, a history is very important, and two, if you don't have a history, you have to use that complex formula. Mm. I think that's risky. That, so there is a rule for compensation. I don't know if you know, but each of the metabolic acidosis, respiratory acidosis, etc., has a special formula that you can calculate whether it's being compensated adequately. And if the compensation fits within the formula's answer, then you know that that's right. If it fits outside, it means that there's more than one process going on. Because we're dealing with this as isolated. Remember, you can have a metabolic and respiratory acidosis. Patients are a lot more complicated than the, the simple things that our exams teach us. So actually, I, I think it's dangerous to, to play with that. I think that if you want to go away, you can look up those formulas, which are very interesting. I can give you some good links for them. But so in this case, the patient's got com compensated respiratory acidosis. So which you know from the history. Yeah. So we've got another example, but I think because of time, we're going to skip through it, but we've, I've included a bunch of examples of just ABGs at the end of your presentations with answers so you can practice, so just interpreting them and seeing what you think. Um, so approaching the anemic patient, uh, um, this is something you'll commonly see as an F1, get a set of blood results with a low full blood count and a low hemoglobin. So first of all, anemia is just defined as a loss of red blood cells, which means a loss of hemoglobin. The parameters in a male, it's a hemoglobin of less than 135 grams per litre, and in a female, it's a less than 115. So basically, the clinical picture depends on whether the onset is acute or chronic. If it's an acute onset, then the patient will present with your signs of shock, which include your um, sinus tachycardia, your hypotensive, the oliguric patient, and cold and clammy peripheries. If the onset is more gradual, it depends on the extent of the anemia. If it's a mild anemia, they can be asymptomatic, or they can have some fatigue or some general pallor. If it's severe, then they present with exertional shortness of breath, tachycardia, palpitations, angina, and your signs of cardiac failure. So when you've got an anemic patient in front of you, the first thing you need to establish is how severe the anemia is and how quickly treatment must be started. So the main thing you've got to ask yourself is whether or not a blood transfusion is required, and that's um, established on how symptomatic it is, as well as obviously when you get the hemoglobin and how low um, it is. And then you need to establish what the underlying cause of the anemia is. Um, so the causes of anemia um, can be split into two. You can have a defective production of red blood cells and an increased rate of red cell loss. So the common causes of defective um, red blood cell production are things such as deficiency of iron, vitamin B12 and folate, anemia of chronic disease, reduced erythropoietin, which is needed to produce the red blood cells, and any diseases affecting the bone marrow. Blood loss and hemolysis are what cause the increased rate of red blood cell loss. So a way of classifying the causes of anemia is to look at the MCV and then that kind that will guide you in terms of what the underlying um, causes of the anemia could be. So if the MCV is low, then, then you know the anemia is defined as microcytic. If the MCV is within the normal range, then you've got a normocytic anemia, and if it's high, you've got what is called a macrocytic anemia. So just trying to go through each type and kind of give you some of the underlying causes. Again, it's really brief. But, um, so if someone's got a low MCV, the next thing you need to look at to establish what the underlying cause would be is to request a patient's ferritin. And depending on that level, that can again guide you as to what a differential could be. So if the ferritin is low, then potential causes could be dietary, a gastritis, or it could be a chronic blood loss from a GI malignancy, 
um, inflammatory bowel disease can cause it, whereas if the ferritin is low, then you've got your anemias of chronic disease and all your hemoglobinopathies, which will not be covered in this lecture. So could just briefly on iron deficiency anemia, because it is one of the commonest anemia, I thought we'd just quickly go through it. So iron is absorbed in the duodenum of upper je jejunum. The causes of an iron deficiency anemia include your reduced intake, so that's common in your elderly patients who don't don't have an adequate diet in your malnourished children. You can have an increased demand, which is um, as childhood growth spurts in pregnancy, malabsorption, so that's um, things such as celiac disease and inflammatory bowel disease. Um, you can have blood loss, which again is through GI malignancies, menorrhagia, or you can have um, chronic infections. On a blood test, what you would see, as we discussed, was a low hemoglobin, a low MCV, and a low ferritin. And in the case that you did request a blood film, you would see these small, pale looking cells, varied size and shape. Um, and management, again, depends on the level of the anemia. So it could be conservative. You'd start with diet. You can give iron replacement, so your oral tablets. Or in certain cases, you can give a parental um, iron infusion. Or if it's severe, you give them red cells. Um, right. Now you're all thinking, why did I <laughs> I know. <laughs> we'll, we'll whiz through them. And if your reticular sites are high, then you know that you're um, losing an increased amount of red blood cells and then they're trying to compensate by increasing it. So that's your hemolytic anemia causes and um, any blood loss. If the anemia is macrocytic, you look at the vitamin B12 and folate. If that is low, then it's what's called the megaloblastic anemia. And if it's within a normal range, you've got a whole range of potential differentials that you could consider and you would request blood tests appropriately. Um, megaloblastic anemia can either be a vitamin B12 or a folate deficiency. So vitamin B12, um, the most common causes are due to reduced intake or impaired absorption. Patient will present with your classic anemia features. They could have peripheral neuropathy, they can have dementia, optic atrophy, and they can initially present with falls. And treatment of these patients is with these IM injections of hydroxycobalamin. Folate deficiency, again, is reduced intake, malabsorption, increased demand, increased loss, and drugs such as anticonvulsants all cause that. And treatment is simple and straightforward. You just start the patient on five milligrams of folic acid once a day. So if you're presented with an anemic patient, key things to ask in your history are the symptoms, uh, which we went through at the beginning, the effect it's having on their life as well, because that will quantify as to how severe it is and whether or not treatment needs to be started um, urgently. And then you tr can try and identify the cause during your history. So it's asking things such as about the diet, drug history, any GI symptoms, so any melina, any PR bleed, any unexplained weight loss. Uh, any recent travel history and any family history, particularly any thalassemias, as that could explain um, the chronic background of, of anemia. So on examination, things that you would look for and you'd be expected to kind of point out if you're in finals with things such as power of the mucous membrane, so that's here in the eye, you'd have a classic nail sign. I've never seen it, but something that they used to like us to know. Um, any lymphadenopathy could be signs of any underlying malignancy could do a GI exam and see if there's any abdominal masses which can point you in the direction of a GI malignancy or you could do a, you could do a cardiac exam as well to see for any signs of heart failure. So just again, just a slide of all the summaries. If in one of my registrars I worked with in my last job with any anemic patient, she wanted us to request the hematinix, thyroid function test, LFT, the full CUX screen and a full myeloma screen. I always thought it was a bit OTT. But um, then in some cases you might want to do a blood film, a fecal or cold blood if you think that's indicated on the history and again based on the history you can think about an upper or lo lower GI endoscopy and a bone marrow biopsy and I hate my screen as well but that's all really dependent on the history. So that was really really quick and I apologize I'm really tired already. So. Basically, ABGs and anemias are huge topics. Anemia is actually more so than ABGs, I'll admit, um, which is why you obviously know ABGs really well now. But basically, we, we've had to summarize it very quickly, and my email's up on the end, so if you ever want to go over any of it, I'm operating an open door policy with students. I absolutely love them. You can come and harass me whenever you want. Right, so liver function test. So liver function tests really bore me. The only exciting thing I think in liver is the fact that we can almost cure hep C now, which I'm sure you all know about. 
profusely. Um, so, liver function tests are, are serum markers produced by the liver. They are not, as everybody knows, function tests. They do not test liver function, certainly not the things we traditionally call liver function tests, i.e. AST, ALT, and ALP. Those are not markers of actual liver function. They are just enzymes contained within the liver. Please do not get that wrong. Markers of actual liver function, as you will see, are albumin and clotting. And those are the two essential markers of how well your liver is doing. So if you're looking at someone in liver failure, yes, you want to know about all their LFTs because they help and those can help lead you to diagnosis, which is where the LFTs are useful. But in terms of actually knowing about how well the liver is operating, you want to worry about this side here. And that will tell you if the person's in liver failure. So just remember that. Uh, and then you've got AFP, which is a tumor marker. And bilirubin, which doesn't really fall into any category. If you do LFTs, you tend to get a bilirubin with it, but actually it's not really technically part of the LFT cluster either. But we'll go through each one in turn. So ALT and AST. Uh, I can honestly say that I went through most of medical school without knowing what they stood for, and you can probably manage uh, without knowing what they stand for, but I did put on the other slide. Uh, it escapes me already. So, these are enzymes which are contained within the cytoplasms of the cells. When the cells die, the enzymes go up. The higher the cells, the more of your liver's died, essentially. Now you do get a small amount in other uh, organs, which is quite interesting, particularly AST. Uh, is found in various different organs within the body. And so a lot of places will only do an ALT as part of your liver function test because it's cheaper just to do one. And then if you want to do anything else, you have to repeat it. But ALT is specific for hepatic damage, and that's because ALT is predominantly found in the liver only, and that's viral or drug-induced hepatitis, whereas the AST tends to rise more in alcohol or cirrhosis. Don't ask me why. I think it's to do with the fact that when you drink alcohol, your liver dies a bit and then gets a bit better, and that, that sort of cycle releases a bit more AST. But don't quote me on that. And that's a ALT and AST. We're going to go through the patterns of sort of what leads to what in a bit. But what's Im the predominant thing that's important here is to remember AST is associated with alcohol damage because that's the one that you're not necessarily going to get, certainly if you work in Leeds, and you have to request separately gamma GT to check that that's coming from the liver as well as the bone. It's also found in the placenta, so in the third trimester of pregnancy, you may or may not remember, ALP is up to two times the limit of normal. There we go. So if you have a pregnant woman with a raised ALP, it's not because she's drinking booze on the side. So, albumin. Albumin's a protein. No surprise. And this is the, the true measure of liver function. Patients who have liver failure get really swollen because they lose the oncotic pressure. Uh, and anyone who's worked in the general medical ward has probably seen a very edematous patient. And that's what happens. But r you have to remember that albumin's affected by a shed load of things. I mean, malnutrition is the very big one. That's spelled completely incorrectly. But it's the big one that you will uh, see people suffering from on the wards. And then bilirubin. So when I was a medical student, we had to learn all about the complex pathways that bilirubin takes for excretion. I'm sure you know all about them and you've done all of that before. But it's basically elevated in jaundice. Jaundice is raised bilirubin, quite simply. And jaundice classification, you've all done peds, so you should know your jaundice inside out, prehepatic, hepatic, and post-hepatic. What's important is when you get your LFTs, you will get a total bilirubin. And sometimes it's really useful to have the conjugated and unconjugated ratio. And the reason is, is if you remember, conjugated bilirubin tends to, it tends to get conjugated first in the liver and then actually in sort of the bowel and the urinary tract. It's very complicated. But basically in the liver. And so if it's beyond the liver, you tend to have conjugated bilirubin that's high. And if the problem's before the liver, you get unconjugated bilirubin because it's not getting time to conjugate. It's a really simple, easy way of thinking about it. So this is just one way of thinking about jaundice as well. Um, so you, jaundice is raised bilirubin. So with a patient, if the bilirubin is high and your no and your LFTs are within the normal range, then you know that the cause of jaundice is prehepatic. So things that it could be you need to bear in mind are hemolysis and what's known as um, Gilbert syndrome. 
and then we'll, we'll go over that and we'll at the end. If you don't know it, I'm sure you do. And then if you look, the patient's got a high bilirubin and their ALP is up, then you know the, in, the cause of it is a post-hepatic cause. So what commonly can be done is do an ultrasound. You see if, the, if there's any duct dilation. If there is, then you know there's an obstruction from either a gallstone or a malignancy. If the, ultra, if the ducts are within normal size, then you've got to think about whether or not this could be caused by drugs or things such as um, PBC and PSC. And then less, least commonly of cause of jaundice is if you've got a raised ALT and AST. So if that's up, then the cause of it is an intrahepatic cause, and that's due to hepatocellular damage, which usually tends to be more chronic. Um, cause. So your patterns of liver damage can either be obstructive or hepatic. So if there's an obstructive liver, liver damage, then you've got, um, there's any obstruction in any of the bile ducts from within the liver all the way to the common bile duct. You get a raised bilirubin, a raised ALP, a raised um, gamma GT, and a normal ALT. If it's a hepatic um, damage, then you've got a very high ALT. You've got varying levels of bilirubin, a slight raise in ALP, and a very high prothrombin time. So other tests that are used in the diagnosis of liver disease, in addition to your LFTs, you do what's called the non-invasive liver screen, so that's a bunch of blood tests. So you'd ask for a viral serology, which includes a full hep screen, HIV screen, a cytomegalovirus screen, and an EBV screen. Full set of autoantibodies, iron studies, copper studies, and AFP. It's like a million blood bottles. When you get asked to do it, your heart like sinks, and you're like, well, I really hope they're flebs tomorrow, all medical students. So if you'll be on gastro all next year, you'll get to do, you have to request this quite often, that's all I spent a lot of my first job doing. Then you'd get an ultrasound scan to rule out any post-hepatic causes of liver damage. Depending on what's found, you may ask you to do any RCP and then potentially, although I've not never seen it done, is get a liver biopsy. So the patient with abnormal LFTs, just to go through some things to ask in the history or not to miss, uh, get your symptoms, specifically ask about jaundice, get a full drug history, get a full alcohol history, ask about any recent foreign travel, any blood transfusions, any unprotected sexual intercourse, and ask about your like diabetes, hyperlipidemia, all these can cause your fatty liver disease. So on examination, things to look for and point out are things, your stigmata of chronic liver disease. So you'd look for any jaundice, any pulmonary edema, bruising, spider nevi. You'd want to do a full GI examination looking for any hepatomegaly, any ascites, any splenomegaly. Obviously, you'd notice, note if they've got any obesity, and then you'd ask for features of hepatic encephalopathy as well. As if a patient tends to be confused in an acute liver failure, then that's... That'll be obvious. Um, um, so some examples again. We're just going to run through them. So does everyone know wait, what ERCP stands for? Come on, somebody knows. It's really important. <laughs> it's vital, vital knowledge. ERCP and MRCP. Is, you should know what they stand for. If you're going to tell a patient you're going for an ERCP, they're going to say, "What's that, doctor?" You should know what they stand for and what they are. I think any test that's really important, you should know. And I'm sure that your guys' medical school is a bit like mine, where you have to sort of explain procedures to patients and your OSCEs. And those are really nice procedures because they're very complicated and they're ones you all forget about. So go and, go and double make sure that you know what all that is and about. Right. So we'll, we won't go through all our examples. We have a few LFT examples as well. But I want to take a little bit of time on this one because it's a really great example. So it's a 24-year-old uh, male medical student, believe it or not, as you can tell by the fact that he got uh, completely wasted after an end-of-term party. So this is how he presents. He raised other things which are sort of non-specifically raised and actually that can mislead the picture. A lot of these patients end up having liver biopsies and everything really inappropriately. Mortality for a liver biopsy is around 2%, which is a bit crazy if you've had it inappropriately and you die. So it's, it's really important to remember that any investigation really needs to be thought out. It's completely harmless. It does tend to occur when you're sick, when you drink alcohol, when you do something like that, you get a slightly more raised than you would. There we go. Over here we've got a sec another example. We've got a 38-year-old lady who's presenting with jaundice and itch and dark urine. She had a UTI a week ago. She was treated with antibiotics by her GP. She drinks 21 units a week and she's a smoker and on examination there's no signs of any chronic liver disease. 
these are her LFTs. If you just want to, someone wants to run me through what's abnormal and what you're thinking behind this is. Anyone? What's the abnormality here? Yeah. ALP, ALT. So what are you thinking at this point? What's that? post -apathic. And what would you, how would you establish what the underlying cause could be? Yep. Yeah. So you do an ultrasound scan and there's no bile duct obstruction. And then if you think back to her um, past medical history, she'd recently been started antibiotics by her GP. So because there's no bile duct obstruction, it fits in with um, drug-induced cholestasis secondary to tomoxiclav. And this kind of jaundice is self-limiting and it tends to resolve over a couple of weeks. He wants us to do the exam. There's no rush. Yeah, we can go through them. He wants us to just carry on. We have okay. about two votes for carry on and no votes for just do it, so fine, we'll carry on. Okay. So this is an 18-year-old... Um, That's a really <laughs> She's recently returned from India a week ago. She's been unwell for the past 10 days with your diarrhea, fever, joint pain, and in the last two days has turned a nice yellow color. She took some tablets in a nightclub and had a small tattoo done whilst in India. Her past medical history is nothing significant. And on examination, she's just visibly jaundiced. B or C. And this is really important because as you know, Hep B and C have a worse long-term prognosis than Hep A. Can you tell the difference on this? So history, yes. Anything else? So some of you are giving me really funny looks, and that's that's absolutely true. Because actually, there's I don't know, most some people don't realise anyway that you can have ALT and AST can actually be quite low in uh, chronic hepatitis C, and in fact in Hep B, Hep B shows a cyclical pattern. So when you first get it, your AST and your ALT shoot up, and you then trudge along at quite a low level, and it then shoots up again when you become unwell. Uh, so it's just important to bear in mind patterns. The last example, this one will be another really obvious one. So it's again, it's a 19-year-old um, student. She's had a bit of a hard time. She's recently failed her exam, split up with her boyfriend. She comes to A&E um, unconscious and vomiting. On further of her history, you find out she's taken 32 grams of paracetamol mixed with alcohol. You do a set of bloods. This is what you get. So what, how would you, what is it and how would you manage this? Uh, What's the most important feature on that blood mm. test? So how would you uh, how would you initially want to treat this patient? How would you counteract these effects of the paracetamol that she's taken? What's that? Yeah, that's right. So it's acute liver failure due to paracetamol overdose, and as you mentioned, you treat it with N-acetylcysteine. And because of her INR, because it's so high, you need to monitor it, get in touch with the liver unit, and then they'll decide whether or not she's for a liver transplant. Um, right, last topic. <coughs> Very last topic. Aren't you happy? And you can go home. So, managing deranged user needs. So user needs are just like the others in that they're a huge area. In fact, when I was in medical school, I'm sure you guys had the same, we had a sodium lecture, a potassium lecture, etc. They can each be done on their own. So what we're going to give you is a really easy clinical guide. So you're on the ward, this is what you do type thing, because I understand that's what they wanted from us. Um, and that's probably the quickest and easiest way to do it. So it's really quick. You'll be very pleased to know. I'm going to start off with an example. So you've just finished uh, uh, two weeks of lovely annual leave in the Bahamas, because when you're an F1, you're earning. That's what you can do, apparently. Um, it's an amazing time, you come back, you start ward round, you don't know any of the patients, you're stressed out of your mind, your annoying surgical reg is on, and uh, the nurse comes and says, these have just been th phoned through, doctor, there we are, which they do do often, usually inappropriately. And so they give you a piece of paper with these results on, are you worried? Is everybody worried? Right, I'm really, really tired of blank faces, hands up if you're worried. Excellent, so much audience participation there, I'm so happy. Thank you, you've made my night. <laughs> so, actually, you're all wrong there. So, the big question is, is, is this old or new? 
Because the fact is, this could be a patient trudging along in chronic renal failure, in which case you're not really worried about that, are you? Because if you've sort of been on the wards, you'll have seen that most of our patients tend to be sitting at that. Uh, so actually, the thing you look at if they're in chronic renal failure, and it's really important, is the potassium. Patients with chronic renal failure get a high potassium, and that's what you worry about. Now, the fact is, this might be acute, and then you are worried. So, whenever you see eusinies, you have to ask yourself, is it new? And how do you check? You go on the results survey, you look at any previous bloods. You hope that there are some. And if there are, you look at, are they uh, deranged, or is it new? So, if it's new, then you're going to follow what we're going to say in a minute. If it's not new, then you have to ask yourself, is it stable? So, somebody might be trudging along with creatinine of 200, and suddenly they come with a creatinine of 300 then you should worry because their renal function is acutely deteriorating you have an acute on chronic problem. So really important. If it's not stable, you have to follow all the same protocols as if this was an acute renal failure because you need to get to the bottom of it. If it is stable, you just monitor. And you monitor the bloods and you monitor potassium. So all renal, chronic renal failure patients, even if they're non-dialysis, they need more regular bloods than your usual patients just because you want to be careful of that potassium. And you can always think about giving them fluids. Fluids always help renal function. But be very careful. That comes with one caveat. If you have a patient on dialysis, you do not give them fluids without a very long thing because you overload them. They don't clear out the fluids themselves. If their kidneys are working, they can pass urine. That's fine. If their kidneys are broken, you do not give them fluids. And the same with blood transfusions. They get a blood transfusion reaction if you don't give them a blood transfusion with dialysis. Been there, done that, it's not very nice. So, there we go. So this is just a really quick way of going through the classification of acute renal failure. So the main thing you need to establish if someone's got those deranged eusinies, if it's pre-renal, renal, or post-renal failure. So easy, it kind of, this kind of summarizes it all in a quick and easy way. So if it's pre-renal, things you'd want to ask about in the history and establish is whether or not there's an acute history of any blood loss, if they've recently had any surgery or any traumatic events, you'd want to look at their drug history. Are they on anything that can cause um, reduced blood flow to the kidney, such as an ACE inhibitor? You'd want to look at your symptoms. These are symptoms of confusion. If they're um, septic, you'd want to see whether or not they've oliguric or anuric. So you'd want to look at the urine output. Uh, on examination, if a patient is um, it, they're de they'd be dehydrated if they've had a lot of blood loss uh, or they'd be with like septic uh, and the management the main thing is you'd give them active fluid resuscitation and you'd want to get the nurses to do a strict fluid input and output monitoring if you don't think there is any um, signs of any shock or any acute um, loss of fluid then you could start thinking about urinal causes although they tend to be less common in causing acute kidney injury but things you'd want to ask in again in a full renal history are anything such as any history of vasculitis any autoimmune diseases any history of any diabetes or hypertension your symptoms again the patient will be oliguric and they would be um, complaining of symptoms of fluid overload um, so your heart failure symptoms. Uh, on examination, you wouldn't feel any kidneys uh, and you would have your systemic signs of your vasculitis, your autoimmune diseases. Uh, and you'd, in these patients, you would manage them by giving them, avoiding any nephrotoxic drugs. So you'd look at the drug chart and you'd make sure the blood pressure is within range. Um, if a patient could also present an acute kidney injury, they've got post-renal failure. So in the history, you'd want to know if they've got any history of any stones, any urinary symptoms. Uh, any BPH on examination the patient would have a massively distended bladder and the way you manage these patients is with a catheter it's important you don't forget about post renal because we had a patient on our ward with really deranged using ease um, and we kind of left them for a day because we thought it was chronic thinking it was pre renal gave him fluids uh, and then found out um, he was obstructed because his, his catheter wasn't in properly yeah a catheter in does not mean a catheter is in catheters block all the time. You will find yourself as a house officer phoning urology to say, how do we unblock this catheter? There's two ways to unblock a catheter. One is to flush it, which the nurses here apparently now aren't allowed to do, but feel free to do it yourself. You just take a syringe of fluid and you flush it. And two is to change it. Now, if your patient blocks once, change it by all means. If they keep blocking and you're having to continue to catheterize them, you're going to scar their urethral tissue and cause a stricture and it's going to become harder and harder or you're going to make them septic by continually introducing infection. So just be very aware of that. 
Yeah, because I always think renal failure, deranged eugenies, just give them some fluids, but then what happened to that patient? Like, all of us kind of missed it, which wasn't great. Um, so, key management... like awful at <laughs> ones, don't we? It's horrible. So, key management principles in any patient with um, deranged eugenies to think about are to treat the underlying cause, to try and establish what's caused this renal failure, treat the complications, uh, so these are, the, you treat the acidosis if it's severe with IV sodium bicarbonate. If they're hyperkalemic, you'd want you to treat the potassium, and we'll go through that quickly because that's a common thing that you'll be faced with as an F1. If their uremic and their uremia is really high and they're not responding to fluids, you need to get the renal team involved and they will do so out for dialysis to happen quite promptly. If they're dehydrated, you make sure you give them fluids after making sure that their bladder is not distended. If they've got signs of fluid overload, such as pulmonary edema, you would start them on IV fluids and mine. But again, be cautious with that because um, if they've got um, really severe renal failure, it can make it worse in some cases. And then obviously supportive management to so try and keep make the patient as comfortable as possible. So just briefly, hyperkalemia, there's, again, it could be, there's three levels of it. If it's severe, their potassium is greater than seven or above. The patient is symptomatic, so things that they'd be presenting for when you don't want to go ask in a history are any muscle weakness, any paralysis, any palpitations. They would have ECG changes, which we will go through on the next slide. If their hyperkalemia is what's known as moderate, it's between 6.1 and 7, and they can be asymptomatic with ECG changes if the if they're mildly hyperkalemic so with a potassium of 5.1 up to 6 uh, they tend to be asymptomatic um, and as a rule we tend to treat I think on the word if it's above 6 uh, depends on depends which consultant yeah um, so these are your ECG changes um, your small absent P waves your broad QRS complexes your classic tall tented T waves uh, and then you have a long PR interval back a second why do we give them insulin? Good, and we give it with 50 mils of 50% dextrose because? Good, what happens if you have a patient who's hyperglycemic with a raised potassium? Remember, most of our patients are diabetic. Oh, there we go, right? So you have to remember that patients that have renal failure are often diabetic. Diabetes is the most common cause of renal failure. The second most common cause is? Come on. Hypertension, you said it. Very good. So, you have to remember. So, if they have a low blood sugar, you want to load them with glucose first before you give them the insulin. It's very important to get sort of this treatment in very quickly because potassium causes arrhythmias and arrhythmias lead to death. But at the same time, if you suddenly hit them with a whole lot of insulin, you're going to push them even lower and that can lead to death. So, it's a very fine balance and in that situation, I suggest to call somebody see. There we go. So to summarize, we've been through ABGs, LFTs, anemia, eugenies, all very quickly. Very, very quickly, in fact. So, any questions? Yes. Okay. okay. Feel free to come down then. How much time is that? It's only 7.30, I told you. It's Samantha, is there? So that's it.